Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And let's admit, not always easy for a hybrid guy like me, that sometimes dedicated video cameras are just better options than the cameras to which we're more naturally inclined, like a Panasonic GH5, a Sony a7 III, or a Fuji X-T2. Especially this guy, Sony's Z90, which you could, if you wanted to, reduce to the equation RX10 Mark IV plus Sony FS5 divided by 2 equals Z90. They've taken the guts of the excellent RX10 IV, I'll put up links to our review of it up here and down below, with its punching way above its weight class sensor with phase detect hybrid autofocus, which in my book is the single biggest jump forward over its predecessor, the Mark III. Though like every other single AF system I've ever used, not infallible either. And better low light performance than you might expect, plus the concept of a superb built-in image stabilized high multiple zoom lens and married all of that to the menu system workflow and many of the options available on Sony's professional XD cam line for broadcast and live event coverage like Sony's FS5 with which I have more than a passing familiarity. The net result is image quality straight out of the camera somewhere between lovely, saturated, contrasty, sharp without ever even going into picture profiles and just friggin unbelievable in good light to what I'd consider more than workable even under bad light. Let's take a look, beginning with some 4K frame grabs, something I rarely do, so you can see just how astounding this little sensor is. These first three shots are from a single slow zoom from our hotel window in Las Vegas earlier this year, handheld. I mean, wow. Three more shots, a continent away in mid-morning sun. These images, pick your adjectives. To me, they just pop. Again, no work in post, no picture profiles at all, no HDR, HLG, no S-Log, no nothing. Now let's shift back to Vegas, handheld again and on the move, where you can see clearly how image stabilization becomes less effective as the focal length becomes longer. Really, the field of view becomes narrower. That's true of all image stabilization systems. On the one hand, you can see the incredible zoom range as I search for an appropriate subject and spy the Las Vegas monorail in the distance. Yet, on the other, you can see how shaky it is, how shaky I am, and how present rolling shutter is, though personally, I could care less. Once I settle and embrace myself, I'm blown away all over again by the image quality. Here's another example, this time better isolating my unsteady hand to show the range and IQ of this Zeiss 2.8 to f4 Vario sonar. AF is pretty well locked on and image quality is just superb. A different setting, same unforgiving light a few minutes later, yet once again the little one inch sensor knocks my socks off. Also handheld. I'm guessing you would not recognize the pulsations as time to match Michael Jackson's Billie Jean and I'm not going to play that song for you now. And while there is flair, I think it's pretty well controlled all things considered, like the fact that I had no lens hood on at the time. The power zoom, a nice to have. The internal ND, a must have. Not too long after that, in a place where day and night have no meaning, we duck inside for late lunch, which might as well be midnight dinner, at least by virtue of the lighting. Now we're exploring 1080p again, and the AF and IQ just rock. Not infallible, but I am running out of superlatives. It was dark in there, and once again, this was handheld. UHD 24p. I did boost the gain, but still, I think this is pretty amazing, especially the color. Sure, the noise is there if you look for it, but in the real world, I am gobsmacked by the IQ, and lay audiences would never think otherwise. The next morning, back at 1080p, Rec 709, and once again, color, sharpness, and that incredible range, just geez. Though, I did set the exposure manually here. Night again, handheld again, we do see the limits of the autofocus, which I wouldn't expect anyone to use for this kind of scene in real life anyway. Here, I've overlaid the original handheld shot of a helicopter taken at maximum reach, 700 millimeter full frame equivalent field of view, with a little post done with the built-in image stabilization of Final Cut Pro 10. This is a 1080 24p Rec 709 clip. 
Of course, we can see how far the IQ is from what we could get with a solid fluid head at 4K, no crop, but from where I sit, this is incredible, especially if we're talking, say, news gathering, given the size and price. Last shot, a screen grab from a 1080 24p clip, this time shot back on the East Coast in 2020 HLG. This was utter crap lighting, yet I love the image anyway. If you boost the gain all the way, does the image degrade further? Sure, you bet. But then, A, you should have lit the scene better in the first place. B, it's time for neat video with a fast processor. C, time to get a grip. You got the shot. The substance of it was amazing. Move on. Or D, next time bring the A7 III with you. Finally, of course, I'm shooting this segment right here, right now on a Z92. Really, at one level, that should be the end of it. It's just an extraordinary image capture machine, which I should add is $500 less than the closest camera in the Sony lineup to precede it, the Z150, which also surprised me when I reviewed it back in 2016. And I'll put a link into that review down below, up above, wherever. But with all of this said, I'm getting progressively crankier about the user experience with imaging gear. And if I were to leave it at that, you wouldn't get the full picture and would miss the more mundane but still fascinating business side of things, like precisely how and why the Z90 gets to be so much less expensive, yet also offers things the Z150 doesn't, like HDR and hybrid log gamma. Hold that thought. Or new ergonomics that I suspect were the primary mechanism which allowed Sony to lower costs and create what is essentially a $2,800 variant of the $500 more expensive Z150. Hold that thought. And while I don't see this anywhere else, I'm fascinated by the fact that B&H is offering 12 or 24 months of 0% leasing on the Z90 in order to lower the barrier to acquisition even further. All of which contribute to the reasons why even hybrid guys like us should pay attention. Because ergonomics and menu system aside, the little Z90 is a better and more cost-effective tool for the kind of live event footage we typically shoot here at Three Blind Men and an Elephant, which is current events, than outstanding hybrids like our Panasonic GH5 and Sony A6300, which we still prefer for everything else. And the reason for that, the reasons for that in turn are pretty simple too. First, as a dedicated video camera for live events, the Z90 is a single device offering pretty much everything we need. Dual XLR inputs with real dials for ultimate quick control of audio, unlimited recording with dual card slots, never worrying about overheating, that gorgeous long reach zoom lens, all the inputs and outputs we need internal neutral density filters, and as I'll say again and again and again, outstanding 4K footage as long as the lighting is good, and especially when the inability to get shallowest depth of field is not an issue. And second, as a small palm-style camcorder, which still has that handle with dual XLR inputs, the Z90 is less expensive than a properly lensed hybrid and dramatically less expensive and smaller than an FS5, let alone three of them. Yet a trio of, I think it's as many as five actually, Z90s can be synced together wirelessly with timecode and also streamed and controlled live through its compatibility with broadcast level tools like Sony's own cloud service uh, XD Cam Air, their MCX500 switcher and RM. 30 something wired remote. In short, if you're a documentarian, a camera crew of one for local organizations with a recurring need to film or stream, uh, an independent journalist on a shoestring or a small TV station, the Z90 should be at or near the top of your list to check out. It certainly is on our list as we already have a gig on the calendar for mid 2019, which requires just this mix of capabilities. But as always, there are caveats, options, and further distinctions to be made. So yeah, the Z90 ticks off a lot of boxes. In addition to the things I've already mentioned, the Z90 offers 
automatic on off whenever you pull back on the tiltable EVF or uh, open up the uh, 1.56 million dot LCD. Uh, Built-in streaming at 5 gigahertz in addition to the more common and crowded 2.4 gigahertz. And the XAVC L codec, which like the FS5, allows 10-bit 422 full HD recording. Add to that the more mundane but appreciated features like unlimited recording, responsive joystick, comfortable grip, proxy recording, which naturally enough switches off when doing dual recording or relay recording, uh, Wi-Fi remote through a smartphone app, uh, clear image zoom uh, up to 18x in 4K, 24x in full HD, which will get you all the way up to 700 millimeter full frame equivalent, full size HDMI and an SGI port, 120 frames per second in 1080, all the way up to 960, which is maybe fine for a coach trying to teach his team the right form, but otherwise, me. And you've got a whole pile of capability in the palm of your hand. But I really want to, well, no, I don't want to, but I feel the need to drill into some of the details of Sony's ergonomics and menu system. I mean, I really don't want to. I don't want to take the time. I don't want to in any way, shape, or form offend the engineers who are better at their jobs than I am at mine. I'm keenly aware that UX issues can be surmounted with determination, time, and dedicated professional camera operators. And I've mentioned this kind of thing ad nauseum before. And I know I am often a statistical outlier, but it feels to me like the market is once again in the process of a major shift. And I don't think Sony has the same latitude to do good enough, or to use a more current term, minimum viable product ergos and menu system anymore. Over the course of a century or so, look, moving and still cameras have evolved from a simple light box or simple light type boxes to computational imaging devices, really, whose manufacturers have progressively moved away from the basics, which remain in my book aperture, shutter speed, and light sensitivity. I mean, I understand why so many of them have done so. It makes perfect sense, as it does in other industries, from software to cars and more, as a means of justifying price increases. And our expectations evolve. Yet this preoccupation with what I'll call a narrow definition of progress, creates a stunning vulnerability in the camera industry that a single company, Apple, has exploited more successfully than any other, gutting an entire segment of the market and putting enormous pressure on others. That is because Apple, and yeah, right, other camera manufacturers, other phone manufacturers, have gone one step beyond computational imaging to make it all simple accessible, while still really, really good. Steve Jobs famously said, doing simple is hard. And I understand that it's much more cost effective to follow Moore's law and update processors and software rather than create new molds in order to change tangible things. But it's not just Apple or Samsung anymore, or any of the other phone manufacturers out there who are focused on the user experience. It's smaller players in the camera industry like Fuji and Leica, interestingly enough. And I suspect in the very near future, the big boys, Canon and Nikon, with their long anticipated first truly serious mirrorless offerings, who are harnessing the power of technology by melding it with accessibility, simplicity, personality, delight, because what else are Canon and Nikon going to do? By contrast, the Achilles heel of the Z90, to be fair, most camcorders across the industry remains the user experience to the point that the menu system of the Z90, in and of itself, independent of intended audience, occasionally fails basic user interface standards. Sony, I love you guys, but you got to hear this, whether it's menu navigation that occasionally dead ends, preventing you from backing out the way you came in, continuing the inscrutable picture profile naming conventions of PP1 to PP whatever, 
forcing you deeper into the menus just to decide which ones you want to change and how, automatically turning off the internal mic when auto is selected in the buried mic select menu, the XLR handle is connected, but no external microphone is attached, so that no audio is recorded if you just happen to pick up the camera and go. Disabling face detection, it's grayed out, and not giving you an easy path to figure it out so that only after you spent 10 minutes or so Googling and futzing with settings, you finally figure out how you have to change an output setting first. But let's just say that these all get in the way. When it comes to ergonomics, the physical controls, it, it feels like Sony sometimes tweaks them without regard for what practitioners need or expect, nor having as an objective standardizing that design once realized across their product lines, at least on the camcorder side. Take, for example, the neutral density filter selector, located by the rear EVF instead of the more natural and typical location closer to the lens itself as it is on the Z150 and FS5. Or a selector switch for choosing zoom or focus for the single ring on the lens, where in fact that ND filter selector would be better suited. A selector switch, which would be completely unnecessary if as on the Z50, there were three dedicated rings for focus, zoom, and iris. A mic clamp. Too big for shotgun mics from Rode and Sennheiser to remain in place, and due to the insufficient height of the handle, can actually project into the upper right frame uh, when the zoom is set too wide. A handle design that, in fact, can get in the way of a teleprompter. When it comes to the user experience of working with Content Browser Mobile to control the camera remotely via smartphone, I just gave up. Unlike the apps I'm more used to on hybrids, including what I use with our A6300 or the A7 Mark III, I couldn't adjust the gain, that is ISO, nor could I figure out how to reliably consistently tap focus. And you can't use the camera for streaming at that point either. Then again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, this is one big reason why you hire dedicated camera operators. They take time to learn their gear cold, learn workarounds, don't complain, and just get the job done. But here's the thing. Here's why I'm taking so much time to go over this. If you're like me, and pretty well responsible for everything from camera to audio, lighting, editing, titling, etc. Probably not unlike a significant chunk of the Z90's target audience. Every single decision by every product manager for every product in my workflow, which leaves things any more complicated than dead simple, is one more nick in the proverbial death by a thousand nicks. And Sony is trying with their HDR and HLG capabilities, right? Reduce the post-production workflow so that you can go straight from camera. But this functionality, HDR and HLG, still feels early to me because without a big Sony HDR HLG compatible TV, even on my 27 inch uh, 5K retina display, I can't see any meaningful differences. The flip side, is that when it comes to S-Log of any flavor, and remember the Z90 offers S-Log 3 and S-Gamma 3, well, it strikes me that it's antithetical to the very point of HDR and HLG in the first place and the camera itself, because when it comes to live events, news gathering, etc., isn't it all about rapid turnaround? Isn't color grading contrary to that workflow objective? Isn't straight out of the camera the goal? Let's move on. Let's turn to streaming, because this is another big part of what makes the Z90 interesting and a big piece of the Z90's positioning. In the end, there are really only a few things to say about the Z90's streaming capability. One, it works. I tried it on Ustream. Two, it's really nice not to have to bother with additional equipment. And three, it was a pain to set up because of what is best described as a late 1970s, early 1980s HP41C programmable calculator interface 
that has no place on a new machine in 2018 if it is intended for smartphone savvy millennials or crotchety old guys like me. Now, the streaming is limited to 720p. There's no 10 bit, there's no 60 frames per second in 4K, but none of these are showstoppers for me and they shouldn't be for you. This is industry competitive, and frankly, you don't want more than 720p or 8 bit or 30 frames per second because of bandwidth considerations. Though, you can argue that there are other ways to skin this cat. Which is a nice segue into a brief discussion of the competition. Which in turn really means several different things. First, let's start with cameras. And let's start there with competitors from Sony's own lineup. The two other cameras that were announced at the same time have the same body, sensor, and autofocus system. The $500 cheaper NX80 and $900 cheaper AX700. Where the Z90 offers Wi-Fi at 2.4 gigahertz and the less crowded 5 gigahertz, the NX80 only offers it at 2.4 gigahertz, though it does allow you to stream too. The NX80 doesn't have the XAVCL codec, which allows the Z90 to record full HD at 10-bit 422, as I said earlier. It doesn't have an SDI connector. You can't use the NX80 to access Sony's XD Cam cloud service. It doesn't allow FTP. And that's about that. The AX700 further subtracts from the NX80 beginning with the handle. There is none and you can't get one. It doesn't have uh, ABC HD, so there's no 60 frames per second progressive, only interlaced in HD. It doesn't offer streaming at all. And, well, that's it. Canon and Panasonic also offer one inch sensor cameras, though frankly, I haven't had them in hand and I'm not really in a position to say very much about them. But if any of you guys have had experience with Panasonic's, say, HCX1 or AGUX180, Canon's XF405 or 400, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments section below. But I will say that I know the sensor in the Z90 and X80 and AX700 well enough and have seen enough online to believe that the Canons and Panasonic's will be hard pressed to match the combination of Sony's image quality, autofocus, and price. Ergos, that's another thing. But if you're a citizen journalist, or even a professional journalist under the right circumstances, there is another very different camera option, and that is a smartphone. Now, scoff if you like, but streaming has gone mainstream. And this is the reality in which the Z90 and its siblings find themselves. And I've seen people live stream two hour town hall meetings from their iPhones directly to Facebook. They blow right past the normal 10 minute recording limit of their phones. They have no issues with overheating. They have no issues with battery life because they're plugged in while recording. And they have no issue with image quality, not because it's great, but because their audience is looking right past that to the substance of what they're seeing, which is usually local officials blowing smoke up their skirts. Though, yeah, IQ is pretty crappy. There is also another fascinating, but in my book, not yet ready for prime time option, a dedicated consumer friendly streaming camera from Livestream called Mivo. This is a clever, forward-thinking system which uses artificial intelligence and resolution in a way I've not seen elsewhere at an extraordinary price point, 500 bucks. It, uh, it looks like, to me, nothing so much as a one-eyed, gray-suited Hugo Boss minion, but that's not the point. What the Mevo does is use a dedicated 4K Sony sensor in a tiny package which connects wirelessly to your smartphone as your mini controller, allowing you to send the stream to any number of platforms. Uh, more clever, it allows you to simulate multiple cameras and camera angles, mm, yeah, not really, from the one camera by either allowing you to zoom in manually or letting Mevo make those decisions for you, which is brilliant, if a little bit disturbing. Of course, 
The main problem with the Mevo is obvious. If you're shooting in 4K, outputting to a maximum of 1080, and zooming into, say, an area one-tenth of the total image being recorded, you know, an inset, a detail, image quality can be awful. On the other hand, as I alluded to earlier, we now live in an era where, say, overnight celebrities are interviewed live on the biggest networks sitting at their kitchen tables using Skype, FaceTime, or Google Hangouts from their smartphones, low resolution and compressed as heck, earbuds plainly visible, and no less compelling for it. But while it's important to understand the broader market in which the Z90 has arrived, these options are not, at least not yet, the market to which the Z90's streaming capability is dressed, and as I said earlier, not really ready for prime time the same way. So let's move to the other two angles on competition, alternative streaming hardware approaches and other streaming destinations. I will try to keep this a little more brief and get you out of here. You don't need to have wireless streaming built into a camera at all. That's the bottom line. You can get a Teradek Video, a Teradek Cube, a Mejuel USB Capture, HDMI Plus, a Blackmagic Design Web Presenter, and I'm sure there are other boxes out there from under 400 bucks in this list all the way up to 2,000 or more. You plug your camera into one of these via HDMI, you plug the other end into your computer's USB port, and away you go. You can actually go higher than the Sony's 720p output up to 1080p, although as I said earlier, that doesn't matter to me. But this approach suffers from what I'll call the holy trinity of production no-nos. More gear, more money, more complexity. No, 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 no. So not my thing, and I can't imagine really it's yours. When it comes to streaming destinations, other than Ustream and XDCam Air, it is clear that YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo Live, and who knows what else is live coming, are not going anywhere, providing the social power, immediacy, and interactivity that, for the moment, no other media can. I can see this being a big draw for the schools, camps, and houses of worship markets, for example. But these consumer platforms are not without their issues, too. Chief among them being onerous, privacy intrusions apparent when you take the time to read the fine print. This is the world in which we live. The revolution may be televised, though it may cost a little more if you want it without hiccups. But let's return to the Z90 and wrap it up this way. Ergos, menu systems, and competitors aside, the Z90 is a heck of a camera. The Z90 is a heck of a camera period. If you need professional level video recording gear for extended live events with autofocus, image quality and live streaming capability that are quite extraordinary at any price, or perhaps you are an indie documentarian who needs to travel super light and is willing to trade shallow depth of field and ultimate low light performance for an incredibly compact, unobtrusive, cost-effective, long and wide reach, high performance autofocus package, taking on cameras like the FS5 or FS7 series in some cases, the Z90 approaches that terribly overused title of game changer. It does. As I said earlier, I already have a 2019 live event gig on the calendar, and while the market will continue to evolve between now and then, the Z90 Actually, the NX80, because I don't need SDI, FTP, or access to XDCAM Air, is at the very top of my list. To repeat, it gives me things. My daily driver, the Panasonic GH5, which is tremendous, doesn't do as efficiently or effectively or at all, especially when I'm contemplating a multicam setup. Although, I want to make sure I understand them and the tools available to go with them thoroughly well before then. Unfortunately, that will take time, much more time than I'd really like, but that is the trade-off for all that capability. But hey, that's just me. And as always, your mileage may vary. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation in the comments section below. You guys are just so sharp and so generous. Just wow. 
share, create a playlist, consider supporting our work by using our no cost to you affiliate links down below or making a contribution directly via the PayPal link down below. As always, we thank you for it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'll be Brownstone. See you next time.